is a short story by Diana Weeks. Stealing Marshmallows. The first thing I taught my new brother, Bubba, was not to ever tell a tale. I was five and already doing forbidden things, like eating marshmallows straight from the box while Mama hangs the wash on the backyard clothesline. I had to pull out the bottom kitchen drawer and stand on the edge to reach the second shelf in the tall red trim closed door cabinets. Then I could get to the delights, 24 puffed powdered sugar coated confections. When I lifted the tucked lid of the campfire box, they were packed layered, three rows of four. Two each is what got me caught. Four marshmallows were missed and affected mom's dessert recipe. The cereal flaked off. Marshmallows were only purchased to make daddy's favorite Rice Krispie treats. I was deemed too young to cook as I might burn myself. Mama didn't make them often. The tempting white, rounded, squarish, squishy, sweet lured me to snitch a few once in a while. Bubba was my lookout, sitting around the corner, because as soon as he sees Mama, he shouts, Mama! She stoops to hug him. I climb down to merely be peering into the wax paper drawer to get a piece to cover my Crayola drawing, alibi ready. If pressed, the truth. But we only wanted to play pretend cowboys and roast the marshmallows on the meat fork over the top front gas burner. Then I could flatten the melted charged marshmallow between two graham crackers and add two Hershey chocolate squares to make s'mores. Mama didn't believe in spanking. She frowned at me and said, I'll talk to you later. Never good news. I had Coach Bubba on the Mama warning yell. I would clap when he did it as a baby until it became a habit Mom loved. I never stand too near Bubba when I misbehave. It's best to be out of sight. This is an adult story by Diana Weeks. Stubbornly romantic. Ed Daniel had a photo on Craigslist with a plea. Grandfather looking for a woman who knows who Sinatra Crosby and Benny Goodman are. And there he was, in a black tux, toasting the viewer with a glass of red wine, artfully held just below his black silk bow tie. I like his looks, I told the friend teaching me how to use my new computer. Ed's web recorded age was listed at very near mine. Answer him, the friend dared. I'd heard many stories of meeting soulmates online. I replied with three general vague lines. No, no, he wants to know something about you. I don't know him. It ended up looking like a work resume. On the subject line, I was direct. Playwright seeks man who likes theater. Ed replied quickly, saying he goes to Broadway once a month. That alone made my panties damp. He made me laugh out loud when he bragged, I don't like any sports, live or on TV. Hooray! Plus, his email address had CPA in it. I worked for a certified public accountant in the 60s, and Ed said he was still working. I would have time to write a lot during tax season. How's business, I asked. Holding up, people still need bookkeepers who can keep them out of jail. Good line. I grew up on Prince Charming Disney movies. I'm the last generation of women raised to be taken care of. 
my grandmother had a maid, my mother had a maid. I just let housework slide and spend the money on theater tickets. Ed suggested we meet for a cameo appearance and coffee at a Starbucks of my choice. I picked one in my neighborhood, but delayed meeting up until after Christmas. I didn't want to get a man into the family mix, even a funny intellectual. Ed emailed me the morning we were set to meet. I'll wear a red tie. He was standing by the front door. It's a good thing he told me about the red tie. His picture on the web was a 30 pound thinner grinning rascal, my type. I've got nothing against teddy bear guys. In person, he had a penchant for funny glibness. He was startled when I took my notebook and pen out of my purse. Would it make you nervous if I take notes? You're funny. Oh, I believe it would. He almost moaned. I won't take notes, but I will write about this. His face went stiff. Tell me about you, I eagerly urge. This is our first date, he complains, in his adorable Brooklyn accent. Born there, but raised in Manhattan. Do you really go to New York every month? Maybe more like every three months. He's been a CPA since 62. He's an only child, perhaps still selfish or not. I cut from the chase. What do you want from our relationship? Oh, what's the point? He looked away. I'm a bisexual person. I was shocked, speechless. He went on talking with his hands. But I don't have AIDS or anything. I practice safe sex. I just like men and women. You're really bisexual? No, no, I didn't want to believe it. That may double his fun, but added more risk than I wanted. He nodded up and down. I had to confess, I probably won't have sex with you. I've had a lot of weird dates, but they've all been fun. He sounded jolly. I was still stunned, stupid, determined, dreams crushed. Mother was right. It was too good to be true. My kids don't want me to marry, and I don't want to marry, I argued. I don't know why. Well, he smiled wickedly with a sigh of impatience. Since you're not going to have sex with me, that's a moot point. He gulped down his black coffee and announced, I'm real busy this tax season. I need to get back to the office. And he gets up and throws words over his shoulder, like he doesn't really mean them. Call me sometime and left without looking back. I started to write this while I was sitting there and ponder his answer to what do you do when you go back to New York? Walk. I love to walk and look, be with people, go to plays, museums, eat at really fine places. Me too, me too. Damn his honesty. This is a grown-up short story by Diana Weeks. Spoiled for a fight. I thought the kids would never get gone to school, work, or wherever. My daughter, her husband, and their two boys and a girl, finally they left. No sounds in the house except the boxer's toenails and ceramic tile beating a rhythmic rumba beat. Last night they had watched me sneak away to roll the joint now hidden in my apron pocket. I beat the dogs to the back door in a covered porch where I dared to light up. The dogs clustered around me, deeply sniffing the secondhand smoke. One would knock against my leg if I held it in too long. The dogs were co-conspirators. They liked to get high, too. They actually grinned at me and growled a happy, loud purr. At last, Relaxation. Thank you, Jesus. I was already packed for my getaway trip to visit my best friend in Houston. First stop, the bank for cash. Her Mary Jane supplier didn't take credit cards or checks. As I drove into the ATM, 
I remember recalling that this machine had eaten my card before. So be careful, I warned myself. When the money came, I stayed to count the 420s, a 10, and two fives, and was so pleased it was correct this time, I drove off without my card. Thinking gleefully that Sally's apartment was freedom, we could smoke in her apartment, all her artsy neighbors indulged. I went the back way on 90A and stopped in Gonzales to buy cigarettes from the Arab convenience store counterman who liked me when I lived there. He sold me a carton cheap and wanted to sell me two, but I had to save money for pot. It's cheaper than cigarettes, but I do both. We chatted about both of us still smoking tobacco when we know we shouldn't. A me has a boy laugh. Searching my black hole striped cloth briefcase purse to pay him, I discovered my bank card missing. Even reminders don't work anymore. My mind flew into panic mode. My gray matter has become as gluey as overcooked oatmeal. Where's my cell phone? I dumped the contents of my bag on the counter, the cell phone slash camera slash web, and I don't know what else it does, skidded to the edge, but I caught it and started breathing. I sat out in the court, called the bank to tell them what happened. It took forever and ever, at least 15 minutes, to get a hold put on my card until I was back in San Antonio next week to pick it up. On the road once more, I wished I could have a hit. I had some shag left, but it was in my backpack on the floor of the back seat. Maybe I could reach it while still driving. There was no traffic on the old two-lane highway. I didn't want to be seen rolling the joint at a roadside park. I slowed down. I could roll with one hand. I fell backward and grasped the straps. It took three practice tugs to sling the heavy bag over the high passenger seat. Come thump! It wasn't easy glancing at the rearview mirror and trying to watch to stay between the shoulder and the middle faded white line, but I did get a few pinches on the paper and rolled a scraggly joint and lit it. Then I noticed the car was stopping. I pressed the gas. Nothing. I was out of gas. How can that be? I just filled up. When the car completely stopped, Franticness swallowed me. Everyone was busy at work. I'd have to get towed. Damn this car. I'll get out and throw rocks at it. Then I reached for my hoodie and noticed there between the seats, the gear shift knob was in neutral. The backpack transfer had knocked it out of gear. Well, then I may as well sit here and finish the smoke and start the road trip again. The blue bonnets were in blue and all seemed so well I was suddenly starved as I entered Hallettsville, looking for the cafe that made good hamburgers. There it is, but there were two police squad cars in the parking lot. Do small towns have drug dogs? I drive to the added-on drive-up window and order a hamburger all the way to go. It was a one window to order and pick up place. The man behind me got impatient and pulled in front of me, shaking his fist, blocking my exit. To bolt from his car to go inside, I suppose to order. I sat and ate my delicious burger, too calm to get mad. Even when he returned to give me his middle finger before burning rubber to depart. So what?